So, you know, it's it's largely non-directed. Um, so, what if um, somebody we notice that somebody repeatedly gets close to talking about something, and then suddenly they have to go to the bathroom, or they switch to something else, and it's, it looks like they're avoiding something. Well, the first thing is we give it a chance to see if it's gonna, if they're gonna realize that, because often, you know, we'll notice that, we'll <coughs> kind of wonder, well, should I make a comment about that? Should I ask them about that? And very often we don't do that, and then later in the session they'll say, you know, every time I start to talk about um, my brother, I noticed I had to go to the bathroom where I started distracting myself, but now I think I'm ready to talk about it. Um, yeah, but sometimes we, if that happens repeatedly, we decide, okay, this is a time to move a little to the more active side of that dance. And but we'll say something like, would you be willing to experiment with not distracting yourself that way? I think this is a quote from when someone was pinching herself and we asked her about it, and this is what she eventually did if she was feeling anxiety about certain things. So we said, would you be willing to experiment with not distracting yourself that way for a few minutes just to see what might happen? So very open-ended, you know, an invitation. The other thing about that is for a few minutes, you know, giving somebody just a little, a few minutes of something instead of like, you know, an eternity. Um, we'll watch the room for you so you don't have to be hyper vigilant. And um, just some things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as we said, we inquire about bodily sensations, encourage release of pain, tightness, energy, let your body do whatever it needs to do, let your body move. Um, and this is, this is a roomy thing that I've always liked, and you said something like this during the break. So, uh, Rumi said, so let the body speak for you now, without you saying a word, like the student walking behind the teacher says, this one knows better than I the way. So we, we kind of cultivate some of that, you know. But see what your body needs to do. You know, you don't have to figure this out. Um, let the, your inner healing intelligence and the medicine in your body just show you what needs to happen next. We use that expression, don't get ahead of the medicine. You don't have to figure out where you need to go or what you need to do next. And physical safety we've talked about. Um, and the music, do you want to say something more about the music now? Yeah, in the first study I had, um two eight-hour play sessions, a playlist of music that were that came a lot from breath work, from our breath work training and what we used. It, it wasn't as active, but it did have some active music in it, drumming and some more activating kinds of music in the middle. And the idea in the first study was that, you know, some of the people were getting the placebo. So maybe they would need something to have more of an experience. And for, the, for those people, we always could follow the eight hours of music or we could go back to the relaxing music or go forward. And you know, we would tell people if they found that they were having a reaction to the music and they didn't like it, to maybe go inside and just see if they were trying to move away from something, if it was stirring some emotion <coughs> that they didn't want to really be with. Um, but we were always, we were always um, able to move on if it was really driving me crazy. What about content? You don't want to no, we didn't well, use words. No, we, no. <laughs> uh, but there are, there's some, there's some dramatic, dramatic music that, you know, can, some people can find pretty intense. Uh, music, was it optional or it was required? Yeah, no, it's optional. It was optional. Yeah, did, it's did you get to choose what kind of melody you wanted? No, or, well, or so in the first study I had these two playlists and I mean, people could bring music, but in general, we used those two playlists and added some more music. And always, if someone didn't like it, we could go ahead, we could turn it off and just have no music. 
in this study, I just have lots of different music yeah. with no words. And in this study, the age group of the people are younger. So my music is not quite as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the, the old Rutherford music, I mean, the younger vets have um, music that they like that is not really in my repertoire. So sometimes we use their music. Um, so, they, so they can bring that in. They, they almost always have it. Um, they always almost have their computers. Um, so it's different at this time. I still have lots of really nice, relaxing music, um, flute, Native American. Um, and I also have some dramatic music, too, that um, is available. So um, we've just been a lot, a lot more. I mean, it's not that we weren't flexible in the first study, but we did just tend to use kind of the same play set. We've had some vets that wanted Crosby, Stills, and that. You know, I mean, yeah, no, I mean. Usually that's later in the session. Yeah, Stan's model, Stan's model is really what we've been training in breathwork is, is no words or not no English words. People really stay with it. And we, we use the music a lot in the first, first study. Um, just kind of stay with the music. People had really amazing experience. Oh yeah. oh yeah, they would yeah. say that. And then we, I mean, we weren't, we didn't have to not talk about that. You know, we'd say, well, maybe we didn't. Either. I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. And usually they were disappointed at first, and then every one of them later said, um, that was perfect, because I got to know you, I got to know the process, mm -hmm. built a lot of trust, and then when I got the MDMA, it was easier. I don't know if I could have done it without that. that. Of course, the ones that got it first off did handle it. But. So, um, can you move on to the next one? Oh, yeah, oh, that's right. <coughs> I was already there. Yeah. So, tra transference, counter transference, this is a big topic, but just want to touch on it. Um, the fact that we have male and female co therapists that, you know, allows for transference to the men and women. Um, and it can be an intense part of it. You know, we definitely don't have the Freudian idea that we're trying to be a blank slate and intensify the transference. We try to be, you know, self-revelatory. We encourage them to ask us anything about ourselves, to ask us what's going on with us at any given time. We know that people are taking MDMA are very, you know, hyper aware of what's going on with us. Um, there is evidence now that they don't pick up negative, perceived negative facial expressions as much as without MDMA, but still, they can, you know, we've had times when people think we're talking about them behind their back, that we're whispering or something about the blood pressure, or, so we really encourage open communication about any of this. And we tell them ahead of time, um, so that the MDMA and the set and setting intensifies the transference, and potentially the counter-transference. And we tell them ahead of time, you know, there might be times when you need to, when you want to talk just to one of us, or more to one of us than the other. And that's fine. We're not going to be offended. You know, you don't have to be polite to both of us. Um, and that sometimes happens. An example that I really like is one of the women in the first study who had been neglected a lot as a child. You know, she was sent to school unkempt without having her hair brushed or clean clothes. And so at one point during the session, um, she had turned to Annie. And, and for about an hour, she just had her back to me, and she was interacting with Annie. And then after about an hour of that, she said, would you brush my hair? So Annie said, sure. So she sat up. It was so beautiful. Annie brushed her hair for a long time. And then she lay back down, and then she rolled over and faced me. And she said, OK, I'm ready to talk to you now. <laughs> Have you noticed that every time I talk to you, I've been trying to impress you with how smart I am? That's how it was to my father. He was a smart guy, and he was rarely there. So that's what I've been doing with you, and now I'm ready to have a real conversation with you. <laughs> and as you can see, the counter-transference, we both just almost started crying talking about um, yeah. that situation. And so that's another thing someone asked in um, one of the breaks was what it's like to be with the people. And it is like being with family after doing these studies. Um, 
and uh, you're sitting with people, and it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, we've had these experiences in breathwork groups too, and sitting with people, um, but a lot happens in a short amount of time. Like, uh, I don't know what is what was one person said about the therapy. I don't know, like, what one session was like. Well, 16 years. 16 years of therapy. Oh. So it is. It's a lot happening, and you're very getting very <coughs> close. There's a lot of the parental kind of transference that goes on with us. And um, people were still in touch with almost everyone. Um, we try to find people to send the subjects to after the study so that they can continue this work and breath work groups and well, not like this kind of work. We don't encourage people to oh, do MDMA work. Well yeah. We want to be clear about no that. we don't. But I mean this okay, this kind of non order based oh, state work. Breath work. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, going you know, sending them to people that understand what they've been through and we learned that we call We've been known to cry all the way home. Yeah. Uh, so, and for us, uh, the most intense thing is when they're young women about the age of our daughters who have had terrible, terrible trauma. So we're going to talk later, hopefully we'll have time to talk about self-care, but it, it can be intense for us too. Yes, we do tell people we've taken, we've experienced MDMA in a therapeutic setting um, when it was legal. Yeah, and, and we share that, um, for one thing, for me, when the medicine is coming on, I have a lot of panic. And so I can tell people about my experience of what it's like and what helped. And uh, same thing with Michael. And so we, we talk a lot about our experiences in breath work, too. You know, how different processes happen for us and how to watch your process. And, Sometimes people will ask Michael about his experience in the ER. Um, because when he worked in the ER for 12 years, he saw trauma. And so especially some of the people in this last study that have been in traumatic situations, the um, firefighters and, and the vets have asked you about that. Yeah. And I think it's really good to let them know that you can meet them in the places that they're asking you about, uh, even with your family. You know, they been through families, and so sometimes they haven't had good families, and that's what you're providing for them in the setting. It's part of the support. Yeah, I, you know, I have to talk about my own experiences with the, all the grief and the guilt and shame about people that died in my care and the time when I practice emergency medicine. And like, you know, if it, I don't just gratuitously lay that on them, but if it's coming up, for them. I mean, we, we do let them know that we've done our own work with this. But then if it comes up, sometimes it's really helpful just to talk about my own process with that or and talk about her process or the fact that we've had a lot of rage on the mat and it's taken many people that contain us, you know. They're amazed to hear that. They think they're the only one with all this rage inside. And so I, I think talking about our own experiences can be really helpful. This, this kind of negates a bias they might have if you haven't taken them in your way. Because I deal with a military civilian bias, and I don't know if you have that. Yeah, that's veterans. come up. Yeah. And that's probably come up too. Right. We've never been in the military, and we, you know, we tell them that. Mm -hmm. We know there's a way in which yeah. we won't understand it as fully as if we had experience in the military, and we want to understand it as well as we can. Mm -hmm. People say they have told us they consider us there. You know, they were reborn there and were their new parents. <laughs> Sometimes it's very explicit. So I don't think it's so much a licensing thing, although I think it, it potentially could be a malpractice thing, I guess, because it's not the standard of care. But I think there's enough now in the literature about touch and, um, you know, that body centered psychotherapy that um, I haven't run into any trouble yet and I figured I was going to do it anyway so <laughs> just <laughs> hope for the best <laughs> yeah I, I can feel kind of a 
contact high when people are feeling really good, and I can feel a lot of the pain. And it's important to have ways to allow that to move through, not uh, let that energy stick. In the, in the current vet study, it could be five, okay. but not five full dose. They, can have, they might have three full dose preceded by two medium dose or two low dose. Wait a minute, no. You said three full dose. I did say three full dose. Followed by two medium. Preceded by. Oh, preceded by. Okay. Yeah. We don't know what the optimal number of doses is. For some people, I'm sure it's more than that. This is just... Um, seems to be a practical number to be able to do research with and safe and safe, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and enough for most people to have a substantial benefit so you know we're still at the stage of trying to show that it can be used safely and effectively and we're not yet trying to sort out all the nuances of what's the best dose schedule what are, how many doses are optimal for whom that kind of stuff that all needs to come later we're in the phase of trying to do the basics of research. <coughs> that setting, um, one person, the first person that dropped out, dropped out after one 75 milligram dose session. And it was, it was complicated, but um, the, the large part of the reason was because he didn't think he needed it anymore. And during his session, part of his experience was, I don't need anything from outside of me to change my consciousness. And he told us afterwards that he actually had not been honest with us about his opiate use because he had a back injury from Iraq as well as PTSD. We knew he was taking opiates, but he said, I wasn't honest with you about how much I was taking and I wasn't honest with myself about why I was taking it. I realized in the session I was taking it to make myself feel better emotionally and I got the message that I don't need or want that. So I don't want any more things to change my consciousness, and that includes MDMA. So that's enough. I can talk about the trauma now with my family and my friends, and I'll take it from here. Um, that was mixed with some trepidation about the next session. So it wasn't just that, but it was a large part of it was that. Later, he, you know, we spent a lot of time with him and let him know that we couldn't come back and change this decision. Later, we gave him some time to think about it. And he later said he wished he had it, but he still was doing very well and came back for all the, he dropped out of treatment, but he came back for follow-up. And at two months and one year, his CAP score was very low. So he got a lot of benefit out of one session. So it's interesting because we had this question, you know, are people going to become MDMA addicts or are they going to want more and more? And here's an example of wanting less and less of Oh, I think there's no doubt that there's some important one session shifts for a lot of the people. And you can see in that graph of the first study, the caps drop most of the way three to five days after one session. It's just a matter of how durable that would be with one session or, you know, our sense is that would not be optimal. But it probably is true that for many people, one session would be very helpful, even if not optimal. And the other dropout, um, I forgot to answer that part of the question. Um, it was uh, somebody who got low dose, and it was so difficult for him to stay there yeah. all that time without being able to distract, do things to distract himself. That he couldn't tolerate the idea. And actually, at that point, we had three low, you know, whatever you got first, you got three times a month apart. So he was looking at having to go for two more months and then another month for follow-up. And he said he just couldn't do it. In fact, he didn't spend the night. He wanted to leave at like noon. And we persuaded him to stay for the rest of the day and then his wife picked him up. And we had to actually, for him to agree to stay, we had to kind of give him more space and let him um, you know, do some stuff with his iPad. So um, after that, we. And, and another person who had a lot of trouble with low dose, we shortened the first phase to two sessions because we thought it was too much to ask people to do that. It seemed to be somewhat activating, but didn't help me through. So those were the two. But he also came for follow-up and was not any better, uh, unfortunately, two, two months later. Um, maybe we can keep moving and, you know, I'm sorry not to be able to entertain all the comments, but we'll also stay afterwards. But I want to 
we've got a break coming up, and we've got a lot of stuff to do there. So. Yeah, so now we're going to move on to integration sessions. Um, so we invite people, you know, this is the first one that occurs the next morning after they spent the night. We invite them to discuss more of the details of their experience, but we also tell them that's not required. Sometimes people have a sense that they just want to hold it inside and not talk too much. We do want to make sure we know where they are and how they're doing. Um, uh, but we don't require them to talk about it. Um, and, you know, we do usually have a lot of dialogue discussing kind of how they're doing physically, how they're doing emotionally. Um, and we have them process any emotional distress or cognitive dilemmas. You know, sometimes people are having, having some second thoughts about the whole thing. The next day, the MDMA is worn off. They've talked about some stuff that they've never talked about before, and then they begin to wonder if that was okay. And we've got some quotes, I think. Um, uh, and we normalize that. You know, we tell them people often have these um, regrets or <coughs> some self-judgment coming up afterwards. It's good to anticipate that. And um, we call them mind robbers. And we encourage people to. Um, you know, reconnect with some of the positive experiences to reflect on, you know, kind of those templates they experienced during the session. Um, ask them about any difficulties with integration and talk to them about ways they might incorporate what they learn, the shifts they've experienced into their life. Um, and a big part of it, reminding them this will continue to unfold. You know, it's not just what happened during the session. We really say that repeatedly, remind people of that. And the idea that things come in waves often. You know, people might be feeling great and suddenly there's a big wave of grief that comes. And we do it, you know, let them know. This doesn't mean you're losing the gains you got. This doesn't mean you're getting worse. This is part of the unfolding healing process that we expect to happen in waves for hours, days, weeks, maybe the rest of your life, you know, and decreasing amplitude, hopefully. And sometimes after the, during the session, they'll talk about a lot of different experiences and not have any tears, and then the next week find themselves crying, you know, at the drop of a hat or just crying for hours, and like the emotion, the grief is catching up to the session. Talk about that. And then, um, you know, sometimes we do some body work at that point, as we talked about before. Um, we, you know, we check out if something happened, it means they shouldn't have another session. It's never happened, but we always have that in mind. Um, and really emphasize our commitment to stay with them and support them, encourage them to call us if they need to touch base or need some extra support. You're, you know, we're available all the time. We talk every day for seven days after the session. Um, we encourage them to take it really easy the next day. They're going to be tired. They're usually emotionally drained. You know, sometimes they feel great. It's not that they always have these um, difficulties afterwards, but commonly there are times when it's not so easy afterwards. And a lot of times they're easy things happening too. And then, you know, we talk to them about some practice to take some time every day to, you know, focus inward to see how the process is coming and make some time and space for it to continue to unfold. You know, any journaling is a good one. Art, soul collage. We've had people make me write music, play music. So here's some quotes from, from after the, from the integration session. Do you want to read some? Sure. I've been experiencing a lot of feelings since yesterday that I haven't felt for a long time. Feels like a good thing, like a loosening of stagnation, of frustration and rage that I've been suppressing. The first times were like opening a door, making you aware that there were even doors to open. A higher dose was about knowing you could make the cho choice to go through the door, 
and experience the feelings. It helped me remember stuff that I don't know if I would ever have remembered. That last session, if nothing else comes of the, all of this, besides the rage not taking over, that's big. So all of those are about emotions and feeling again. It's like the whisper of the inner healer stays with you. Remember what you've learned. So after the um, day after the fifth session, as interesting as the sessions are, I know from experience now that it's even more interesting what happens after the sessions when you're making connections. Oh, and the, so the symptoms, as we said, they may increase temporarily afterwards. Um, important to anticipate proper support and involving the significant other in that. And some of the challenges, um, you know, there's a lot we talked about how much suicide there is in veterans and active duty military and uh, we've had many people in the studies who have had periods of feeling suicidal and even made suicide attempts and been hospitalized in the past. You know, we don't rule out, a lot of studies don't accept people with that kind of history, but you know, if we're not going to treat veterans who've been suicidal, what are we doing? So we take it very seriously, we're very attentive to it. We actually, there's now an FDA requirement for all psychiatric drug studies that you administer the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale every time you see them. Um, it, it gets short, pretty short because you're just asking them since the last time we saw you, which may have been like the night before. Um, you're asking about suicidal thoughts. You ask them in the morning of the MDMA session and then at 4 o'clock. So, and we've had don't people have, them that day. have waves of more suicidal thoughts afterwards, and that happens, and we've supported them through it. Sometimes they'll say, they'll say, well, um, you know, how was your night when you see the next morning? They'll say, oh, it was good. I slept pretty well, um, and I haven't had any suicidal thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> they laugh. You know? No one has made an attempt. We had, we've had one person. Uh, call who lived in another state and was, you know, had a therapist at the VA call us and tell us she was suicidal, she needed to be in the hospital, um, and she was calling her psychiatrist. We called the psychiatrist, she went, she was admitted, but she told them she didn't want any drugs, she didn't want to have to drop out of the study. So they kept her for three days until she was stable enough to go home. She went home and she came back and completed the study. She did quite well. She was um, actually a person that said she really thought she could use more sessions. But she, she had a lot of benefit. We haven't seen her for the... Wait, did we see her for the one year? We have seen her for the one year follow yeah. um, And we've been in touch with her and it, it seems that she's doing well. Okay, so... The anger feels like a volcano. I'm afraid of being a one-man wrecking crew. I feel such sadness, loneliness, nausea. This was after the next day or the next during the week. Since I've realized how shut down I have been, I don't ever want to go back to being that way. So I'm having a hard time in business situations or with my father, knowing when not to say everything I'm feeling. So integration. Yeah. How do you integrate this into your life? Who not to talk to. Just like in breath work, we tell people not to change anything in their life for at least the next month. That includes your husband or wife or your job. And, you know, so th dramatic things happen. So we've had some things like that. But we've said, no, come on in and talk to us and, and we'll work through this process. If we can we hold that for a minute because we're almost at the break and we just want to finish these quotes and then maybe ask us afterwards. Um, oh wait, we didn't read these ones yet, did we? Um, after, all the, after all these years of not talking about it, was it really safe to reveal that I felt physical pleasure along with the horror when I was abused? Now that the medicine has worn off, I sometimes feel guilty for seeing the things I did about my parents not being emotionally available. I know it wasn't about blame, but there's still that judging voice that says we don't talk about any of this. 
I have respect for my emotions now rather than fear of them. What's most comforting is knowing now I can handle difficult feelings without being overwhelmed. I realize feeling the fear and anger not nearly as big a deal as I thought it would have been. Being able to feel again is indescribable, like a blind person being able to see again. I used to have a barrier between me and everyone else. Oh, I'm behind you, sorry. Well, no, you know, I'm getting a, a different side. But you know, I think I read from one side of the page to the other, rather than across. Okay, I keep getting the message from the medicine, trust me. When I try to think, it doesn't work out. But when I just let the waves of fear and anxiety come up, it feels like the medic medicine is going in and getting them, bringing them up, and then they dissipate. You know, just a comment about some of those challenges. Some people have said, well, this is all very expensive to have all this therapy time. Why don't you just put, give people the MDMA, put people in a room, and let people check on once in a while, and then see what their cash score is. I think you can see why we don't think that's a good idea. The, the integration period and support, then, we think is really important. After you've ridden a few of those waves of fear, then it gets easier and easier, easier to trust the next one. I can feel my body without having to make reference to the attack. My body is more than a victim. My body is my own. It's not there for somebody else. Last night, I had a clear sense that I got where I needed to get. What was missing has been found. What I needed, I've gotten. I don't feel like... I need to do that again. I think there are still other issues in my life that I can work out with less intense methods. Another one, I don't think I would have survived another year. It's like night and day for me compared to other methods of therapy. Without MDMA, I didn't even know where I needed to go. Maybe one of the things the drug does is let your mind relax and get out of the way because the mind is so protective about the injury. Maybe skip that one. I'm thinking, um, should we go on to the like, images? Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to go ahead a little bit. Um, so these are, um, <coughs> it's striking how often people have these vivid images that describe the healing process that's happening. <coughs> so there are quite a few of those, and we'll give you some examples. Okay. It's like, this, this is the guy that had one session. He said, it's like there's a veteran from Iraq. And he said, it's like PTSD changed my brain and MDMA changed it back. So he'd like to prove that with scanning when we get the time. Um, and this person said, it feels like a gradual rewiring of my brain. It feels like the MDMA session for cracking the ice. Because the trauma was so solid before that, it took a long time to integrate and it was confusing. But gradually I found that I could get back to that kind of state on my own. It was incredibly intense around the MDMA sessions. It was a lot like a big bubble from the unconscious that popped. It brought up a lot and it took time to slow down. Um, this guy said, being in Iraq was bad, but for me what was worse was having my body back here and part of my mind still in Iraq. Being in the study allowed me to bring the rest of myself home, and I know there are a lot of vets who still haven't been able to fully come home. Just the last quote is somebody who had uh, relapsed and was in the relapse that had one more session that we just did, and this is about her mother. I'm able to love her more the way she is with all of her flaws and abilities to give me emotional support and love, but just love her that way and not feel the same level of hurt, disappointment, and grief over it. Okay, so here are the healing images. So this is, Annie mentioned this person. It's like every time I go inside, I see flowers. These are from during the session. Every time I go and see inside, I see flowers and I pick one. And that's the thing to work on next. And there are things that are hard to take, but each time I move through them, it feels so much better. It's like there have been ropes tied around me and now they're loosening. It feels almost like the, this is a veteran. 
um, from the rock. It feels almost like the inner healer or the MDMA is like a maid doing spring cleaning. It's as if you thought you were cleaning before, but when you got the things you didn't really want to deal with, you just stuck them in the attic. If you're going to clean the house, you can't skip the stuff in the attic. <laughs> and we didn't tell him that. He told us that. <laughs> um, okay, and this is the same guy during the session. He said, the medicine just brought me a folder. I'm sitting at this big desk in a comfortable chair, and the medicine goes and then rematerializes in physical form, bringing me the next thing. This is a folder with my service record. It says I need to review it and talk to you about it from the beginning so that it can be properly filed. Oh. Incredible images, I think. Um, MDMA, and this, this is the same guy, MDMA is like being the boss of the company and taking a tour of the grounds. Since you don't usually work there, I guess meaning the unconscious, since you don't usually work there, it's confusing. But then you see it's all going well. Everyone's doing their job, so you can go back to being yourself and trust that it's being taken care of, like a program running in the background. And then just a few examples of somebody asked about spiritual experience. Um, and here's some examples of, kind of spiritual images. And I'll, on Saturday, I'll talk about how we've been tracking that formally. But it wasn't an easy experience, but it was so worth it. It was very, a very spiritual experience, very expansive. I feel a sense of calm and stability now. I have a much greater sense, much greater connection with the wise inner voice, inner knowing. It used to happen occasionally over the years, but now since the MDMA sessions, it's very common. Some think it's my inner wisdom. I think it's God. Uh, and here's an image of a, a sluice box with water coming out. This is what the person was experiencing. Oh, yeah. You want to see it too? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't need to have diverter gates. I just need to let it flow out of me. I've had all this baggage and you can make the journey with, and you can't make the journey with all this baggage. Now I'm throwing out the stuff I don't need to move forward. What I need is love, compassion and concern. What I don't need is needing to be in control. Last one. I see huge white doors with beautiful white glass, so huge and heavy, but a master has engineered them, so you can open them with one hand. It's only without the fear that the doors are so light. How interesting. If I go up to them with all the fears, it makes me weak. I'm taking those fears out of different parts of my body, walking, looking at them and saying, it's okay, but I'm leaving you here. The fear served me well at one time, but not, not now for going through these doors. And then the last one is, I'm a huge pile of fertilizer and composting and turning into beautiful rich soil. It's a perfect time to have rain. I'm a converter. I'm the earth. I am. Leaves, rain, even acid rain hit me. And I have a powerful ecosystem. All can be absorbed. What we're doing here is turning compost. <laughs>